Hello, and welcome to Yesterday, Today, and Forever, a virtual ministry of the Churches of Christ. It is our desire to present to the 21st century person the faith of the first century Christians. We seek unity through the acceptance of the faith that was once and for all time delivered unto the saints, a system of faith which first began to be spoken by our Lord prior to his crucifixion and was later confirmed to the saints by the apostles and inspired writers of the New Testament. Thus a faith from yesterday, to, today and into forever. Our speaker is Brian Barrett, who preaches for the church at Bear Branch, in Spurlockville, West Virginia. We encourage all persons interested in the faith of our fathers, to open their Bibles, as we search the scriptures, for these eternal truths, which can lead Christians back into unity as the family of God. Now, here is Brian. We're studying this morning in the book of 1 John, the second chapter, and we'll pick up at verse 22. First John 2, 21. John says, I have not written unto you because you know not the truth, but because you know it, and that no lie is of the truth. Who is a liar but he that denieth that Jesus is the Christ? He is Antichrist that denieth the Father and the Son. Whosoever denieth the Son, the same hath not the Father. But he that acknowledges the Son hath the Father also. Let that therefore abide in you which ye have heard from the beginning. If that which ye have heard from the beginning shall remain in you, ye also shall continue in the Son and in the Father. And this is the promise that he has promised us eternal life. These things have I written unto you concerning them that seduce you. But the anointing which ye have received of him abideth in you, and ye need not that any man teach you. But as the same anointing teacheth you of all things, it is truth, it is no lie, and even as it hath taught you, ye shall abide in him. And now, little children, abide in him, that when he shall appear, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. If you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone that doeth righteousness is born of him. In these particular verses, and again going back to verse 20, uh, as we were looking last week, we were talking about those who uh, had the spirit of the Antichrist, and though people uh, today want to talk about the Antichrist. They wanted to talk about him or the Antichrist back then, but John said there were many Antichrists that opposed the things of God. And as we were leaving off last week in verse 20, it says, but you have an unction or an anointing from the Holy One, and you know all things. In these particular verses that we're looking at here, uh, we're going to see, again, the three uh, persons of the Godhead. That is the Holy Spirit uh, with which they were anointed, which by the laying on of the apostles' hands, uh, and apostles' hands, uh, they had received. And so in verse 20, he says, you know all things. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that they know how to cure cancer or how to split the atom or send a man to the moon or live on the planet Mars. You know, those are not the things that he had in mind when he was writing this. But he's talking about all the things that pertain to what it means to be a Christian and what it means to be faithful to God. And, you know, these verses are very important for us uh, we have people to say, well, you know, I, I know that's the way that they did it back then, but this is the way we do it today. And I want you to think about that philosophy as we look at these verses and see 
uh, if indeed that philosophy holds true. Now again, we're not talking about the fact that when the church met at that time, they may have left, uh, they may have met under the light of an oil lamp, and today we use electricity. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about the tenets or the teachings of Christianity, what it means to be a Christian. And so John says that they had received that anointing of the Holy Spirit, uh, the Holy One, uh, the, the Holy Spirit of God, that they had received that so as to know all things. But it's interesting to me that whether you're talking about a Corinth or Rome or wherever you go, Galatia, you know, these different churches that we read about, and even though they had the gift of the Holy Spirit and they had an understanding of all things, it is amazing at the number of people who came in and said, well, now I know that's what they do in Jerusalem or I know that's what they taught in the early days of the church, but you know, if you don't do this, if you don't do that, you need to do this. And, and somehow they managed nonetheless to lead these individuals away from the truth. You know, that's, that's kind of an amazing thing to me. And this also shows me that we have now, as they did then, free will. The Holy Spirit didn't make a church be faithful. The Holy Spirit supplied the information that if they followed, they could be faithful. But if they chose a different path, you know, the Holy Spirit did not force them back into submission. And so this, this is an interesting thing. And that brings us up to today as we continue. You know, we see what's happened to Christianity. And if the Holy Spirit who was given to them back then through the laying on of the apostles' hands, did not force the early church to comply, but allowed them the free will to listen, to obey, to do, or to do as they pleased or as someone else taught them. Then today again, we have the New Testament. We have the teachings that were there in the early church. We know what it said. But again, if we don't want to follow it, you know, if we're again like those that say, well, you know, I know that's what the Bible says, but I think this is as good as that. Don't expect the Holy Spirit to step in today and hit you upside the head with a two before uh, and say, you know, no. You know, or drag you out to the woodshed. You know, it's, it's, you have free will. Now, they had free will then. And John reminds them, you have an anointing. Uh, now, that doesn't necessarily mean that every single one of them did. But nonetheless, there was a sufficient anointing of the Holy Spirit that the things that they needed to know to be faithful to God. And so it's interesting. Notice what he says. I have not written unto you because you know not the truth, but because you know it, and that no lie is of the truth. Hmm. That's weird. You know, this letter is being written to you not to give you anything new, and it's not because you don't know the truth. I'm writing this letter to you because you know the truth. That's, doesn't that seem, that seems like it's kind of weird. You know, you know the truth, so I've got to write this letter to you. Even though you know all things, I'm writing a letter to you to tell you things that you already know. Hmm. It's, it's just an interesting concept but not if you understand it in the light of free will and the fact that somebody shows up teaching something and claims that 
God spoke to me this morning. You know, God laid this on my heart. What are they supposed to do? You know, is this from the Holy Spirit? Is it not from the Holy Spirit? It goes against the things that the Holy Spirit taught us, but He says that it's from God. Well, John just says, I'm not writing to you to tell you a lot of new things because you've known the things that you need to know from the very beginning. And I want to remind you that. You know, Peter, when he was writing in Second Peter, said, you know, he was writing to them to stir up by way of remembrance many of the things they already knew. You know, it's, it's just so easy to know something, but in the course of time and the way that people drift without, again, testing, checking, looking, uh, you know, again, pondering the whole situation, you can find yourself off course. You know, and so sometimes you, you really have to check and make sure what you're doing. One of the amazing things to me, some, some of you may have, have seen it before, but uh, these large commercial jetliners that are filled with passengers. The pilot has control of the plane right to the point that it lifts off the ground. If you ever watch some of the YouTube videos of these commercial flights, you'll see the pilot and co-pilot and they're flipping switches and they're moving the uh, throttle to the jets and all of that. And they get up to certain speed and then they will call rotate and what that means is they pull back on the yoke and they've reached one's looking sort of at the speedometer and when they reach the speed that the jet can take off uh, they pull back on the yoke and for just a few uh, seconds they're holding the controls of the plane and as the plane starts up, they reach up and flip a switch and turn loose the yoke. And until they get to their destination or until something else happens, that plane is flying itself. Now, I don't know how many people really know that. I mean, we know there's an autopilot <clears throat> and a close, of course, as they get close to their destination, uh, they will reach up and flip off the autopilot, and they will take hold. Well, they'll take hold of the yoke and then flip off the autopilot switch. And then, for the next couple minutes, as the plane reaches the airport, the pilot is in control. Periodically, they will check to make sure that their coordinates and all are as they're supposed to be. But again, that's autopilot. And there's been many uh, accidents and things that have happened that people have questioned. Did something interfere with the autopilot of the plane? Did the plane do something? You know, again, it, we don't know. It, it crashed. We know that. You know, Maybe, you know, again, I suppose there are jetliners, the hundreds of them, probably thousands of them fly every day and they do it with autopilot. And in most cases, there's little or no incident. But the church was never meant to operate on autopilot. The church was meant to continually consider what God had said and if the church is on the course that God put it. There was never a point in time where we were supposed to close up the book and put it on a shelf somewhere and say, we know everything now, let's just be a church. You know, that's why we continually study the Scriptures that's why, as John said, he wrote the letter. 
And he wants them to know that no lie is of the truth. So if you know something to be true and someone says different, then you need to follow the things of the truth. Up is up and down is down. And again, there are those who want to argue everything. But John says we have to be careful. We know the truth. And in the early days of the church, as there are now, there are many preachers, teachers going around uh, preaching and teaching. That's what they do. But John says be careful because if they're teaching something that is not consistent with the truth, you automatically know that God has not changed anything. And that's what we need to understand. In the New Testament, God has not changed anything. You know, he, he has given us that new covenant. He's given us those things. He's not going to change anything. And so uh, what happened in the early days of the church is the same thing that needs to happen today. And if somebody tells you something that's not consistent with the Word of God, just as if it was not consistent with the teachings of the Holy Spirit, John just says it's a lie. You know, if it's not something consistent with the leading of the Holy Spirit or the teachings of the New Testament, it's not the truth. And remember John 17, 17. Jesus said, Sanctify them through Thy truth. Thy word is truth. And so if it contradicts what the Bible says, it can't be true because something can't be right and wrong and wrong right at the same time. And so John says, I'm not writing this to you because you don't know the truth. I'm writing it to you because you know the truth. But my intent is that even though you know the truth, is that you follow the truth. And that's where the trick comes in. That's, that's where the rub comes in. And over the years, the church has been exposed to many things. And especially the dark ages when uh, the Bible was taken away from people. Many people couldn't read. And so they had to rely on someone else to tell them what God expected of them. And that created a very dark time in the history uh, of the church and Christianity because people were forced to trust individuals who weren't telling them the truth. They were telling them that God wanted them to do this and this and this, and at the same time, you know, there wasn't any Scripture to back that up, but that's okay because they don't know the Scripture anyway. And a lot of false teachers prey on individuals who either don't have the ability to read and comprehend enough to know what the Bible says, or they just don't want, and they may just be lazy, and they don't want to study, but they'll give them a feel-good religion, and that feel-good religion makes them feel good, and you can't feel this good and this happy and rejoice in the Lord this much and be wrong. And so again, you know, dark ages now, then, John says, know the truth. Jesus told him, ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. But if you believe a lie, you're brought into bondage to uh, the devil and his minions as they try to lead us from uh, the things of God. And Paul said in 2 Corinthians 11, even the uh, devil himself masquerades as angel of light. You know, he remembers what it used to be like. You know, the devil once was a faithful angel of God. Think about that. 
He knows what it's like. And He knows how to pretend to be one and make other people believe that He and His ministers are ministers of light. And so, uh, lots of problems. One of the issues that John apparently was having to deal with is that there were those who were denying that Jesus is the Christ. You know, there were Jewish individuals as well as Gentile individuals who were not happy with these new folk that came into town preaching this gospel of Jesus Christ. And the Jewish folk, not all of them, liked the idea of calling Him the Messiah, the Christ. And the Gentiles, while they weren't necessarily many of them looking for Christ or Messiah, they didn't like the fact that these people coming into town, uh, such at Ephesus and uh, Philippi and other places, uh, you know, they caused people who for generations had worshipped the idols and brought money to the temples and did all that, and they stopped. And they wouldn't have had any problem if the Gentiles had embraced Christianity but still worshipped also this God. But the very basis of Christianity is what we find in the Old Testament, and there is but one God, and you know there, there are no other gods, even though they be called gods. And so, whether they were Jews, whether they were Gentiles, there were those who uh, were upset with the fact that people were embracing Jesus, and they wanted to teach things that were not so. And one of the interesting examples is in the last chapter of the book of Matthew. In the last chapter of the book of Matthew, we find there about the, the resurrection and the events that took place there. And when they told them what had happened, the Jewish leaders, about the resurrection, that's not what they wanted to hear. And so they paid the money. Matthew says they paid the money and told them if, if anybody asked to say that while they were asleep, His disciples came and stole the body. Now, that's kind of interesting because if I'm awake, how do I know who stole the body? If I'm asleep, how do I know who stole the body? And so that was the tale they told so that uh, these particular Jews who opposed Jesus could spread the lie. And Matthew says that that story, that tale, was still being told even in his day at the writing of this book. And so that shows us that Matthew wasn't written uh, right after the day of Pentecost, but it was written many years later and the Jewish leaders were still teaching the same things. And so he says... These individuals, uh, the Jewish leaders who were trying to uh, get the Christians to revert back to Judaism and renounce Jesus. Yes? Yeah, stuff that came, just stuff that came into the temple. Yeah. Well, you know, they took money from somewhere and gave it to Judas, 30 pieces of silver, and then they told him he couldn't, they couldn't take it back because that was blood money. Where'd it come from? Wasn't it blood money when they bribed Judas? I mean, but it was okay wherever it came from to give it to Judas, but they couldn't take it back because it was blood money. And they came up with this money, and yeah, it probably came out of the, the temple. Uh, some of them, uh, one way or the other, you know, the, the Levites and many of the religious leaders were paid uh, out of the tithes and offerings there uh, at the temple. And so, you know, there, uh, there were times that the cities were in an uproar. Thessalonica, 
Uh, we remember the statement, the men who turned the world upside down have come hither also. And so they were upset with the apostles who had came there and they put the city in an uproar and they had to send Paul away to Berea. Uh, and, you know, that just didn't magically disappear. And when you read the history of the early church, there were persecutions against Christianity that came both from the Jewish side as well as the Gentile side. Eventually, of course, with the destruction of Jerusalem, uh, Rome came more and more into power and Rome persecuted uh, the Christians. And then, of course, we know that eventually Rome uh, joined into Christianity, but then they turned right around, hijacked it. Uh, and so there, there's just a lot of things. But John's still saying, you know, there, there are many people who have a lot of things to say about Jesus and they want to uh, deny Him and deny Him as the Christ. Uh, and he says uh, that's part of the Antichrist that denies not only Jesus, but denies the Father and the Son. It's hard to deny Jesus and still embrace the Father. And because the whole purpose of Jesus' coming was at the will. Um, John 12, Jesus says there, you know, He gave me a commandment, what I should say and what I should speak. And so the things He said and the things that He spoke were not true and that's not the Christ, then the things that the Father sent Jesus to, to teach and to do uh, it would be hard to be on a good side with the Father and uh, reject the Son. And it would be hard to alter and change the teachings of the church and be in fellowship with the Holy Spirit and the works of the Holy Spirit. And so he says, Whosoever denieth the Son, the same hath not the Father. Verse 23. Now you notice that the rest of that verse is in italics, and so it doesn't necessarily appear in the original text. But the, the point uh, is that, you know, whoever, as the translators were looking at this, they needed to understand. Whosoever denies the Son, the same hath not the Father, but he that acknowledges the Son hath the Father also. And so. Uh, one implies the other, and that was their their point in the translation. If you deny the Son, you deny the Father. If you embrace uh, the, the Father, then you acknowledge the Son and the Father, and you have to, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a package deal. The Father, Son, Holy Spirit, you know, the teachings of the New Testament, it's, it's, it's all a package deal. You... You don't say, well, I, I don't like the Son, but I'll keep the Father and the Holy Spirit. And, and we, I don't like that verse, so we'll get rid of that one. And I've got a better idea. We'll put this in there. I mean, it's, it's not a mix and match kind of thing. You know, it's, it's a package deal. And so you either accept it or you reject it. Let that therefore abide in you, which you have heard from the beginning. And in that sense, we should go back to the book of Acts, the second chapter, as the beginning, which is the beginning of Christianity and the beginning of the church. Uh, it is, is there that the gospel message is first proclaimed. The plan of salvation is given. The worship of the church is, is mentioned, the fellowship. And so that which they have had from the beginning, the fellowship, the worship, uh, the lifestyle, all that goes along with that. If that which you have heard from the beginning shall remain in you, you shall also continue in the Son and in the Father. Now we don't necessarily have um, another italics thing like verse 23. But what happens if you don't abide in the things that were taught from the beginning? I mean, we know if you do, you have the Father and the Son, but what if you don't? 
And again, the same truth is there. Uh, if you don't abide in the truth, then you don't have the Father and the Son. What you have is a lie, and God won't embrace a lie, and the Son is not going to embrace a lie. And this is the promise that He hath promised us even eternal life. And so the conditions of all that that He gave us, the things which we've heard in the beginning, is, is if we are faithful unto death, I will give thee a crown of righteousness, Romans 2.10. But if we're not faithful unto death, if we're not faithful, period, then... Uh, Again, don't have the Father, don't have the Son. Obviously, we don't have the teachings and leadings of the Holy Spirit because we're going against everything that He taught, everything that the Bible says, or we're just picking and choosing and substituting at will. I want you to think about that when people say things like, well, I know that's the way they did it in the beginning, but we do it differently today. You got, you got to think about that. Why? How? Who, who gave you that authority? Jude writing in Jude 3 says that he felt it necessary that he write and, and encourage them that they should earnestly contend for the faith which was once and for all delivered unto the saints. And again, the King James says once, but the word there means once and for all. So that which was given in the beginning, John is saying is still valid when this was written. And if it was still valid when this was written and they weren't supposed to be substituting then, where do we get the authority to substitute now? I mean, if they, they weren't supposed to be changing things then, why should we be changing things now? Where is the authority for that? And, and we can't find that. These things have I written unto you concerning them that, and he uses the word seduce you. You know, who tempt you and try you and want to pull you away uh, from the truth. Uh, to again, they have no truth to give you. And so again, they're back to that lust of the eye, the lust of the flesh, the pride of life. They're back to feelings and emotions and what you want and what you desire. And we're going to give that to you. And so that's what seduction is. You know, I'm going to pull you away from whoever you're with, whatever you're doing. And the way that I'm going to do that is I'll make, you know, promises to you. I'll give you this. You know, you can experience that. And so it, it, uh, John uses the very word. It, it is a seduction. Uh, we are being seduced away from faithfulness and the truth to unfaithfulness. Yes. Well, the same. Same guy talking here in the later, last, near the last book, in this one, it's not it, but uh, he says, do not add or take away because it would be same time to you, same time. And not to add to or take away from the things written in this book. Uh, and so we, we need to think about that. And it says, the anointing which you have received of him abideth in you. It's interesting, the Holy Spirit hasn't went anywhere, but if you're not going to listen to Him, uh, he's, he, you know, he can only go so far, right? With free will. You know, the New Testament's here. We've got the Bible in front of us. I mean, we can read it and we can study it and we can do all that, but if we're not going to follow it, it, it really, you know, it's, it's a waste of time. And, and so, you know, we have... Uh, that it abides in us. And once again, you need not that any man teach you. And that doesn't mean that the church isn't uh, in need of teachers and preachers. But the point is, you already know what you need to know. The first principles of the doctrine of Christ, the Hebrew writer, uh, you know, every Christian should understand when the church established, 
when it was established, should understand God's plan for salvation, should understand the items of worship in the Lord's church. They should have a pretty strong understanding of the difference between things which are right and righteous and the things which are sin. I mean, you know, we can get into the deeper theological stuff, but John says, you know, you know the truth. And those first principles, those basic things, you really shouldn't need anybody to teach you that. You should already know those. You know those things. You know, we don't have a 12-piece orchestra beating on drums and da people dancing in the middle of the aisles and, and all that kind of stuff because it wasn't there to begin with. John says, you know these things. You really don't need me to teach that. But the only reason it comes up is there's those who want to seduce you. You know, they want you in their group. They want you for whatever purpose, whatever means, and they will give you whatever you want. That's, that's a pull. You know, I'll, I'll you know, we... we you know, we don't have a problem with this. We don't have a problem with that. Oh, that's not sin. All oh, those old hard liners, you know, they don't understand what the world's like today. You know, well, you know, you, you know, people are, are born that way. And it just goes on and on and on. And, you know, there, there is that ongoing. And John says, you know the truth. It's the same truth that's been taught from the beginning. And every Christian should understand those truths. Now, again, there, there's a lot of other things, deeper things, meat of the Word, which in time we will learn if we study. But every Christian should know the very basics and know when they're being sold a bill of goods. You know, you, and know when you look at it, it's not what you want. You know, you, you go on a car lot, and you look at the car and it's rusting, it's falling apart, and the salesman's telling you it's in perfect shape. It's driven by a little old lady every Sunday to church. It's garage kept. And if you let him talk you into believing that piece of junk is, is really worth buying, then the only thing I can say is you're getting what you deserve. And it's the same way. We're sold a bill of goods. Oh, this is all right. You know, this won't hurt anything. You know, it's, 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 it's acceptable. And so John says, you know, you, you should know. You know, really, you don't have an excuse. Now, somebody who just came into church might have an excuse, but anybody who's been in a church for a while shouldn't have a lot of excuses about some of the issues that come up in the body of Christ. And so again, it teaches you all things and is truth. That's the Word of God. It is no lie. And even as it had taught you, ye shall abide in Him. You know, as you've been taught, so abide in Him and His teachings. And now, little children, abide in Him, that when He shall appear, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before Him at His coming. And this takes us back to the purpose of this letter, to know. You want confidence. You want to stand strong. You want to know things. Then keep the Scriptures. Do as He asks. You know, sometimes people get caught doing things that they didn't want anybody to know about. You know, they find themselves in a position or in a place that it becomes an embarrassment because they shouldn't have been there and they got caught. Well, again, when Jesus comes again, there's going to be a lot of people embarrassed because they're going to get caught where they don't want to be and be misled as they shouldn't be. If you know that He is righteous, 
you know that everyone that doeth righteousness is born of him. And if they don't do righteousness, if they're not interested in righteousness and the things of righteousness, then they're not of us. They may have been with us at some time. It's clear that they have went out from us and it should be clear that they are not of us. Because if they were of us, then they would have continued with us. But they went out that it might be made known that they were not of us. Our time. Why not make this the day that you and your family seek out the Church of Christ in your community? We encourage you to attend one of our worship times or Bible studies. God's grace, truth, and salvation is truly worth finding and knowing. May God bless and keep you as we walk together in His truth. And remember as always, the Churches of Christ salute you. Our new programs are posted to Facebook and YouTube on Thursday afternoon, and they should be available for viewing by 7 p.m. We also encourage our viewers to visit our website at www.thechurchesofchrist.life. We ask that you like us on Facebook and share our programs. On YouTube please share and subscribe for notifications. This program was pre-recorded.